All right, well, welcome to our discussion of Moshe Never Died. Now, we all know that, that Moshe died, but I'd like to show how in the book of Bamidbar, not only does Moshe die, but he gets stronger <clears throat> as he comes toward the end. And he never actually dies in the book of Bamidbar. So let's take a look at this, and then let's see what lessons can we learn from this idea. <clears throat> so let me share the screen with you, and we'll get started. So... I like to suggest the audacious idea that actually Moshe never died. We'll see in a moment that this idea has roots in other Midrashic sources, but it's, it's sort of, in some ways, my own idea. Uh, now, the, uh, in the book of Bamidbar, we'll get to this week's Parsha later, but in the book of Bamidbar in general, which we're in now, the book of Numbers, um, the... Um, Moshe is told that he's near death because he's told, You didn't trust me. You didn't show your faith to others. To sanctify my name in front of all the Jews. Therefore, you will not bring this congregation to the Aaron. You will not bring him to the land, which implies that he will die. And in fact, Aaron dies shortly after that. So we expect Moshe to die shortly after that. And we know that Aaron died in the 40th year. So, um, so we really expect Moshe's death. So starting Parshat Chukat, where we have the sin of the hitting of the rock, we expect that Moshe will die any minute now. But instead, we have Balak, we have, we have uh, Pinchas, and we have Matos Masse. And in Chukat, Balak, Ma, uh, Pinchas, Matos Masse, Moshe is very active and he doesn't die. Okay, it's time. Shem says to Moshe, last week's parsha, parsha, pinchas. That's it. Your time is up. Shem says to Moshe, Alel Harvim Azeh, go to this Mount Avarim, and Ray the Irish. You should look at the land. that I'm giving to the Jews. Ra'itota, you'll see the land. And and you will collect your bones into your fathers. In other words, you will die. Just like your brother Aaron. He, he was involved with the hitting of the rock. He died. Now you're going to die too. So that's it. Uh, we're, uh, we're in Parshas Pinchas. And uh, Moshe's, uh, oh, he's gone, right? There he is. You should see the land, see the Jordan, but he can't go in. Moshe's response, after all, Hashem says, Hashem, we tempt we die. Hashem says, you know, you, you, you rebelled against me in those bitter waters there, the fighting. So Hashem, so by Daber Moshe Hashem Lemor, the only time we find in the whole Torah that it says by Daber Hashem Moshe Lemor. Sometimes it says God's by Yomer Hashem El Moshe. Many times God speaks to Moshe. That's not unusual. But the language by Daber Moshe El Hashem Lemor, who usually is called by Daber somebody else, somebody Lemor, who usually speaks unto somebody saying. Right? Hashem speaks to Moshe saying, lay more, or that he should say. But here by the bear Moshe, Hashem spoke, speaks to God, sort of in the voice of God, and says to him, what does he say to him? Hashem May God appoint, so, after all, you are the God of all spirits, of all breath, of all flesh, a man over the congregation. We've got to have a leader. Forget about my dying. Who's going to be the next leader? Let's not discuss that I'm dying or that I am going to die or that I don't want to die. Forget that. Who's going to be the next leader? They can't be like a sheep without a shepherd. That's Moshe's response. And by the bear Hashem, Moshe, more. Moshe says it forcefully. He says, God, wait a second. Don't tell me that I'm dying. We have to have a new leader. We have to appoint some. Now, <clears throat> Rashi said that, um, he said, let him appoint somebody. When Moshe heard that the God said that after all, you should have given the inheritance of Tzlavcha to his daughters. He said, it's, wait a second. Is the time that I should ask something for myself that my son should inherit my position? Uh, Moshe thought this is a great opportunity to get a good shtella, a good position for his children. Of course, we know his children were not going to take over and he was told to appoint jo Joshua and give him smicha to officially appoint him for the anointing of the hands. I'm sorry, a little thing there. Moshe responds to his death with a request. Uh, Moshe said that, that, that uh, we see that, that great people 
people of stature, when they when they they don't when they're about to die, they don't occupy themselves with their own affairs, but with the affairs of the community. The Sifrein Bamidbar says Rashi quotes it that that Moshe, when he heard that he was going to die, he didn't say, "Oh no, I'm going to die." No, he said, "Wait a minute, we have to worry about the communal affairs. What are we going to do about the Jewish people?" And Moshe always says in this book, he always says one more thing. Reminds me of the story with the. Uh, Stereotypical thing in the this the old show Columbo. There was this detective, and he would walk in, kind of innocent, slumpy guy, walks into an apartment, talks to somebody, collects some information as a, as a detective, and then he seems to walk out empty-handed. And then he turns around, and he says, uh, "And just one one more thing." And that one more thing was always what what uh, convicted the criminal and proved the case. So Moshe says, "Oh yeah, you want me to die? But just one more thing. One more thing." So Hashem says, look, now I'm serious. First I said you were going to die. Then you played this game, anointing Joshua game. And now you're going to anoint Joshua. We have to have a ceremony. You have to have a, a tributary dinner. You have to give uh, farewell gifts. Uh, okay, that was, that was one thing. But now we're serious. Take the vengeance from Midian. Because Midian made a licentious attack. They made a moral attack against the Jews. They sent their girls to, uh, to seduce us, make us sin, and we were going to, destroy them for having done that. It was Bilam's idea that the only way to get the Jews is not through cursing them, but making them sin. And um, so Hashem says, all right, I'll tell you what, one more thing, take revenge against the Midianites and then, then you have to die, okay? So now Moshe is in business, he's not dying, he's gotta be in charge of the military operation. And Rashi says, although he had heard that his death was associated with this matter, he did it gladly and did not delay. You see, if you told me, God forbid, you said to me, look, Rabbi, I want you to run this summer camp and then you will die. So I would say, well, you know, um, I don't know, the summer camp, we don't really, uh, we don't have any room at the synagogue for the summer camp. I don't think, you know, with the COVID, I don't think we should be doing that because as soon as I have the summer camp, then I die. So so he says, he says, revenge from, the, take revenge from the Midianites and then you will die. So Moshe, Moshe said, okay, let's get to it. Moshe spoke to the people and he told them to do it and that he didn't delay. So Moshe shows his heroism even, even as he's supposedly uh, about to die. He's the ever dying Moses in this book. I'm sorry, some sort of uh, computer problem here. Anyway, then we, we spoke a few weeks ago about how Moshe achieves four victories in this section. Moshe, the, Moshe is the conqueror. It's Moshe, the great conqueror, right? Moshe, uh, uh, the, the Israelites conquered the king of Arad. And then we learned in Parshat Chukat, the, Moses finally, hears a repentant people. They finally apologize that they've sinned against God. They've sinned against Moses. They finally apologize. It's wonderful. Moshe never had it so good as when he started to die. Before he was told he was going to die, the Jews were always complaining. Now that he's told he's going to die, the Jews said, we have sinned against you and God. And it's wonderful. They repented, and Moshe played his old role that he had played in the plagues. Moshe prayed to stop the plague. Moshe prayed to stop Pharaoh's ten plagues. And Moshe prayed to stop the plague of the snakes against the Jews. And the Jews said, please forgive me. Then, instead of complaining, after Moshe is supposed to die, what do we find? That the Jews, instead of complaining, what do they do? They sing a song. The water is wonderful. We have so much water. For 40 years, they complain, we don't have any water. It's no good. The man is no good. And now that he's about to die, what do they say? Oh, it's wonderful. You have the well. It's terrific. So things are changing. Things are improving. Things got better for Moshe once he was told he's going to die. They're, they're all singing praise to God. Then he had victory number two, Sichon. One of the Transjordanian kingdoms, the Jews fought against him. It doesn't mention Moshe, but Moshe was involved in settling land. They settled in the Amorite land. Number three, Moshe sent spies. The last time they sent spies, they landed wandering in the desert for 40 years, as the joke goes. But this time, Moshe sent spies, and they had conquered, they conquered Yazer, a certain city, and all the suburbs. And they inherited it. They lived there. They conquered it. He's the great conqueror. Moshe was involved. He's supposed to be dead. 
He's sending spies. Victory number four is very dramatic against Og, the king, the, the king of the giants. He's the giant. And, uh, and, and they, they, Hashem says, you shouldn't worry about him. Moshe, you shouldn't worry. Implying that God is giving Og in his hands, which led to the Midrashic story, which goes like this. There's Og boasting in front of the people. The Gemara Brachos says as follows. Gemara Brachos says that with regard to the rock, if you if you ever in the desert and you happen to see that rock, you can say a blessing thanking God. What was the rock? Oh, king of the Bashan, he sought to throw upon Israel. He was so big, he could pick up one rock, throw it on the Jews. It would be like a three-mile rock. It would knock it on their head. They'd be dead. So there's a tradition about this. Gemara relates that Og said, how large is the camp of Israel? Three parsons? What, three miles? I'll pick up a mountain that's about three, three uh, parsons long. I'll throw it on their head, and they'll, they'll all be destroyed. Like, you know, Saddam Hussein and other people have thought, it's a small country. Just one bomb, knocks them all out. So he went, he uprooted the mountain of three parsons long. Again, this is, this is a midrash. You have to sort of take it metaphorically, okay? And he, brought, he put it on his head like, like Hercules. And the Holy One, blessed be he, that's God. He brought grasshoppers inside that mountain and they pierced it. So this, he thought it was this big clump of dirt that was like a rock, but the grasshoppers made holes in it and it crumbled on his head and it fell on his neck like a, uh, like a yoke. So he wanted to take it off his head. So his teeth were extended for one side and the other one, but he couldn't remove it. And that's what Zad, that's what it says in the Psalms, you break the teeth of the wicked. And that's according to what Rabbi Shimon Lakish said, one of the great rabbis of, of, of Israel, what is the meaning that I've written you break the teeth of the wicked? That means that you lengthen the teeth, that they have long teeth, and that he, they broke his teeth. The story continues, how tall was Moses? He was 10 cubits tall, he was about either of a 15 or 20 feet tall. Again, you take it midrashically, it's hard to take it literally. And he took an ax 10 cubits long. He jumped up 10 cubits. So let's say if you take it maximally, he was, he was 20 feet tall. He, he took an ax that was 20 feet tall. He jumped 20 feet and he struck Og in the ankle. Because <laughs> Og must have been, you know, like a, a, a 10 story building. So, so the rabbis say, what are the rabbis saying? Moshe, the dead Moshe was extremely active uh, at this point. Moshe was, he was a, a warrior. War, Moshe, the personal conqueror of Israel. He was able to actually uh, conquer Israel. He did it himself. According to the rabbis, it's not just Israel that won against Og and Sihon. He did it himself. Now, now I want to take a little digression and remind you that one of Moshe's goals in his life was not to do it all alone, right? His plan all along was, he said at the burning bush, God, I will not do this by myself. Send somebody else. So Hashem says, all right, I'll get you Aaron. He'll help you out. Moshe was always in favor of delegation. Of course, his, his father-in-law, whom he loved dearly, he agreed to live with his father-in-law for many years. He greeted him like a hero. There's never been such a wonderful greeting like Moshe greeted Jethro. And Jethro says, you're going to fall apart. You've got to appoint, you can't do it alone. You've got to appoint other officers to help you out. So Moshe, his father-in-law, they were always in favor of having extra help, right? And in Balotcha, in the book of Bamidbar, a few parshas ago, Moshe says it very explicitly. Look, he says, what do you think? He says, he says to God, did I give birth to this nation? Did, am I, am I the, the, the mother? Are you telling me to carry the Jews in, their, my, in, their, in my bosom like, like a nurse carries a suckling uh, 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 on the land which you, which you promised the father before? You want me to like, like carry them like a baby to Israel? Are you, are, you, are you kidding? So what is Moshe saying? I never understood this. He says, very simple. A mother cares for the baby. No, really no one helps out. It's it. The mother does everything. The father, every now and then, he throws a diaper, he puts a bottle or whatever. But really, the mother has the whole responsibility. So, so, the, um, so Moshe says, is that what you want me to do to the Jews? You want me to be in charge completely by myself? Moshe was always advocating for help. He wanted help. Why am I mentioning this? Because we're going to see that as Moshe is about to die, he finally gets the help he always wanted. In Dvarim, 
He says it. It's one of the only verses in the Torah we read as a lament. We read it in a sad tune. Read it before Tisha B'Av. And we read it with the tune of Tisha B'Av. And Moshe says, how can I, how can I bear unaided the trouble of you, the burden of the bickering? I can't take it. I need help. So I want to have people, smart people, wise people who can help me out and I'll put, you, put them in charge. So Moshe has always been in favor of getting people to help him out. And there was never anybody to do it, right? He had to do it all alone. And I want to show that his great, one of his great successes in the end of life, as he's supposedly dying, the ever-dying Moshe, who's been dying since Parshat Chukat, Balak, Pinchas, Matos, Masai, half the book of Bamibar, he's dying. I want to show that actually uh, he achieves this. He is no longer going to work alone, as we'll see in a moment. He can't do it on his own. So in the end of Bamidbar, we're going to see that Moshe does not work alone. But let's look at, for instance, at when God says, uh, right before God said, that's it, you're dying, you go into the mountain, that's it. And Moshe said, wait, wait, we, we have to appoint Joshua, and then we have to fight against Amidya. So right before that, the daughters of Slavchat approach Moshe, and the Nesiyim, and the Rashi Matot. I'm sorry, he approached the Moshe on the scene. At the end of Bamuk, Bug Bamidbar, the Moshe approaches, one second, uh, Moshe, number one, when the Benot Slavcha, these daughters, those daughters who wanted equal rights in, 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 in inheriting the land when there were no brothers, so they, who do they approach? Moshe and the leaders of each tribe, the Nisim. We have a whole parsha called Matot. This week's parsha is Matot Mase. The first parsha is Matot. It's a parsha addressed to the Rashi Hamatot, the heads of the staff, which means the heads of the tribe, which means the Nesim. As Rashi says, it's the Nesim, the heads of the tribe. He has a whole legal section teaching the heads of the tribes. Moshe is very into the idea, and he teaches it at the end of his life to teach the leaders the on problem, that they didn't kill the right people. Moshe adjudicated the case with Moshe, Elazar, and the Nesim, the leaders of each tribe. Ruvain and God, at the end of his life, he had another case, another Shaila, another question. Ruvain and God approached Moshe to conquer and to inherit the eastern bank of the Jordan. And Moshe and the Nesim and Elazar and Yeshua, they solved the problem. In Parshat Masay, the new Nesim are listed, and they're good guys. They're not going to be rebels like the last time. And then, in the case of the tribe of Menashe against Benot Slavchad, right? First, the daughters wanted extra rights. Then the tribe said, wait a second. If they get married to people from outside the tribe, they're going to ruin our, our tribal land. So there was a new case against the daughters of Slavchad, also adjudicated by Moshe and the Nesim, the helpers. At the end of Moshe's life, he gets help. In the case of Benot Slavchad, in the case of the laws of Midian, in the case of Reuben and God and Mase. In all these cases, at the end of Bamibar, Moshe is not alone. Moshe fulfilled his dream that he wouldn't be doing it alone. He'd be with everybody else, with all these other leaders. So now let's get to this week's Parsha, Matot Mase. Matot, Parsha, the only Parsha in the Torah addressed to the heads of the tribes and the staff. And Mase, where he uh, reviews the history of, of the Jews and where, they, where they've been. So, number one, what do we see him doing in these two parshas? Number one, he rebukes. You see, the Jews were supposed to kill the daughters of Midian because they made a moral attack against the Jews. They seduced the Jews. They weren't, it wasn't that they found the Jews so manly or something like that. They were trying to seduce them, make them sin, and lower their moral status so they couldn't proceed to the conquer Israel. So Hashem says, you've got to destroy Midian. So they destroyed the Midian, but they kept the women alive. But God said, that they're the ones... What are you talking about? Those are the ones you're supposed to destroy because they're the ones who, who attacked you morally. So Moshe and Elazar, that's Aaron's son, who's now the high priest, and all the Nesim, they go out into the camp and Moshe gets mad at the leaders. So they're leaders. Moshe is rebuking them. He's involved with the other leaders. He has Elazar working at his right-hand man because he always wanted Aaron or his nephew to, be in to help him be in charge. And of course, in this parsha, it's all about teaching the Nesim. He's going to teach the heads of the, of the staffs, the heads of the tribes, all about the laws of vows, which are important when you make wars. And then 
in that last war, in this parsha, also in Matot, he says, you know, take the revenge from the um, uh, take the uh, avenge the uh, the Midianites. So what does Ramban say? Let's take a look at the Ramban. What he says about this idea that in this week's parsha, Moshe, before he dies, he has to take revenge. It was decreed that Moshe would not pass over the Yardin. But on the eastern side of the Yardin, all the leadership roles were incumbent on him. Whenever he was on the east side, he had to do it. He conquered the two great Amorite kings. He apportioned their land to Reuven and God for an inheritance. Uh, and then it was he who selected to take, who was selected to take vengeance from the enemies of Hashem. At this point, he's still in charge. He may be half dead, but he's not dead yet. He's going to be in charge of this war, and the Ramban sees that, that although he's supposed to be dead, he's supposed to go up to the mountain and die like Aaron, but he's got stuff to do. He's got to take vengeance. He's got to apportion the land. He's got to teach things, and he's a big success. When they fought against Midian, they, they turned to Moses and they said, your servants have made a check of the warriors, and not one of us is missing. We fought a war without one casualty. Moshe is a great conqueror, four conquests, and a big success. But Moshe rebukes them, as we said. He says, wait a second. You didn't destroy the women? Exactly, again, how, you, how someone can fight against the women? Something very difficult to understand, but that's what the Torah says, that the women made a moral attack against you. They were licentious. You've got to attack them, and they didn't do that. Uh, so he says, it's ridiculous. The whole reason we're fighting Midian is not because of the men, it's because of the women. So you must destroy them. And they went and they did. How that works, different discussion. And then, um, and then Elazar teaches the Jews. Elazar, why is Elazar teach? He says, if, if you have here, if you have a, a, a pot that you get from the enemy, you have to take it to the mikvah first. That's the idea of Tavila. Can't we take Caleb to the mikvah? If you have a new pot, you take it to the mikvah. Where do we get that from? This week's Parsha. But who taught it? Elazar. Elazar. So Rashi says, why Elazar? He says, well, he's the guy of purification. Anything with mikvahs, Paraduma, the red heifer, he, he's the man. It's this, the second command. He's in charge of that. Chizkuni says, because Elazar had chutzpah. Elazar jumped in front of Moses and said, look, he's dying anyway. Let me explain these laws. Or maybe he's a good student. You know, he, he, he learned the laws. He's telling, he's telling the Jews the laws. But I want to suggest that they, Elazar was chosen to teach these laws because as Moshe is dying, he sees Nachas, he's shepping Nachas. Elazar, his student, one of the key students were the students of, of the children of Aaron were his key students that he taught them first. Elazar is teaching the Jews. Moshe would be thrilled. Moshe is always happy. He wishes everybody would be a prophet. He's not interested in the glory. He's happy as he's dying to see Elazar taking over. When, um, when Aaron died, uh, Moshe took off Elazar's, uh, Aaron's clothing and he put it on Elazar. So when Moshe, when Aaron died, he saw a direct transfer of authority from himself to his son. When Moshe dies, he doesn't see a direct transfer of authority from himself to, uh, to, any, to, to, to his children, but he does see a transfer to his nephew, who is now in charge of teaching these laws. And then Moshe is in charge of the last donations. Moses gave the contribution. Uh, that people made in the spoils of war, and he gave them, so Moshe is involved in charity before he dies. And then Moshe rebu rebukes again. The tribes of Reuben and God, they said, hey, we like it here, we'll stay here. He said, what? You have to conquer Israel. This is not Israel, this is Transjordan. They all class about that. What's the status of Transjordan? But he said to them a beautiful line. Are your brothers to go to war while you stay here? This is a question I ask myself all the time. My nephew in Israel, he has to fight in the Israeli army, and I just sit here and say, go, nephew, right? I mean, right, we're sitting here doing nothing. How do you do that? So Moshe rebuked, before he died, he rebuked the tribes of Reuben and God. And um, he says, he, he tells them, he says, look, I'll tell you what, if, if you go to the land, he, he rebukes and he also gives them land. He says, look, if you go and you help the people conquer uh, the other side of the Jordan, then you can come back and keep this side of the Jordan. So he gives them land, he apportions land. Moshe is settling the land. He gave them, he gave them the land of Sichon and O that he had conquered himself. He gave it to the Reuven and God and half of Manash. And also Moshe, as he dies, like many people, when they're reflecting on life, they become historians. And he wrote down all the different places they were 
as Rashi says, he says, you know, oh, remember over here where you spilled the juice? Remember when we drove down that highway? I, I, I got stopped by the, uh, by the uh, police officer. Remember when we went over here? I got a flat tire. And he told the Jews all the places they were in the last 40 years. Moses, the historian. And he draws a map for them of where they went from here to there, to Negev, back to Jericho, and all around through Moab. Also, Moshe warns them. He says, well, you've got to conquer this land. If you don't conquer this land, the, people, the inhabitants there will be thorns in your side. I know you want to be nice. You don't want to hurt anybody. But if you don't destroy the people there, they will be a thorn in your side. Also, Moshe settles the land. He says, these are the guys in charge of settling the land. This is the tri from the tribe of Judah. This is the guy in charge of settling land. The tribe of Manasseh, this is the guy in charge of settling land. Moshe sets up Levite cities because the Levites, as I explained, are very important in this book. They're also part of the leadership and they get their own cities. And Hashem teaches him the laws of the cities of refuge, that there are certain places where there are refuge. And the Gemara Mako says that Moshe knew that these cities would not function. If anybody was killed somebody by mistake and they ran to go the Golan, the city called Golan, at that particular time, it would not have functioned as a, as a city for refuge. Not until they conquered Kedesh, Shechem, and Hebron on the other side of the Jordan would these cities work. But the Gemara says, the Talmud says, that he's figured, look, I'll set up the cities now on the Eastern Bank, and then when the other cities are set up, they'll start to function. But now we have to set them up now. Um, so Moshe sets up cities of refuge. He's very big on that. He thinks it's very important. And then there's one last case. Before he dies, I'm sorry, before the book closes, before the curtain goes out in the book of Bamidbar, there's one last case. And how does the case take place? They don't approach Moshe, because as his father-in-law says, you can't judge by yourself. So the heads of the tribes of Menashe, who understood that they were in charge, and they were leaders, they approached the Moshe and the Nisim, the heads of each tribe, the 12 leaders, and they spoke to them about the problem of these daughters who were going to marry husbands from a different tribe and take land away from their precious tribe. So the last case was also Moshe had help. Moshe, one of Moshe's goals was to have help. In the end of his life, in the end of this book, the last scene is a case is adjudicated. Land is given out. Leaders are in charge. People are helping out. People are taking leadership roles. So I want to suggest that if we look at the, as the book comes to a close, what do we find? We find as the book comes to a close that Moshe doesn't die. Um, Moshe doesn't die. So where did I get this idea that Moshe doesn't die? So for this, we need to look at another Midrash. There's a story about Jacob. The Gemara in says, Jacob didn't die. So one of the rabbis said, he says, what do you mean? He says, he says, if if he didn't die, then why do they give? Why do they mourn him? Why do they eulogize him? Why did they 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 uh, they embalmed him? They why did they bury him? He says, what are you talking about? He says, uh, so he says, no, look, I'm 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 going to save you. And it says in the, Jeremiah 30, I'm going to save you and I'm save your children. Just like your children are alive, so are you. Jacob never died. So we have the idea that David Israel we say in our prayers that David is David, king of Israel, is alive. Jacob never died. We have an idea that some of our leaders never die. Uh, one time I was in my salvation class and he said that it was a group that asked uh, Salvation if he would speak at the 850th anniversary of the Rambam. Uh, so he said, Oh, uh, the Ra I didn't know the Rambam died. Because for, for a Jew, all of our great heroes are still alive. They're still alive. So the Book of Amidbar literally ends this way. The Book of Amidbar literally ends this way that, um, that, um, that Moshe doesn't die. He, the book, God told him twice, you're, okay, it's time to die, just like your brother. And he's, wait, you have to have Joshua. And he says, all right. Uh, he says, fight this war and then you'll die. And he doesn't die. It's like when you want, don't want to do something, right? You don't want to, you don't want to leave. So, oh, before I leave my mom's house, I think I have to water the geraniums. Oh, uh, let's have a piece of cake. Oh, let's, uh, let's look at the old family pictures. And before you know it, it's 10 o'clock at night. You still haven't left your mom's house because you don't want to do it. Uh, so, so, uh, so too in this book, Moshe, the book ends and he still hasn't died. 
And so uh, in a sense, Moshe never dies in this book. One second. So uh, Jacob seemed to die. He looked like he was dying. He was on his deathbed. His children were around. The rabbis say he never died. So, so if we think about it, it's really not that different from the, from the book of Devarim. In the book of Devarim, Moshe does die, although some say that those words were written by Joshua. In other words, in Moshe's book, it doesn't say he died because he wrote the book. <laughs> in other words, you can, right, the, the rabbi said, who wrote the last eight verses where Moshe dies? I don't know, he wrote it while he was crying or did Joshua write it? But in the book of Amibar, it's more, more logical. He can't write he died because he, this is his book. So he, he doesn't write that he dies because he, if, 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 he, if he's writing that he dies, then, then he's not alive. Then he can't write it. So, uh, so let's see how Bamidbar and Devarim are actually similar. What do we recall about Moshe? In other words, what is the historical, the Jewish, the Torah memory of Moshe? Well, you look at the end of the book of Bamidbar and see how it portrays his death. And look at the book of Devarim, which is all about the last month of his life. So I, I want to say that, it, that, that the, the two situations are similar. What do we see? Uh, we see that um, that what, what happens in Bamidbar, it says that um, he has um, m- military wins. He, he had military wins. He had military victories. Um, so we see that. That Moshe in the book of, we're going to see next week in Devarium that Moshe recounts the military victories. We see that he settles the land, that he describes how he settled some of the land. Uh, also, sets, he sets up some of the mitzvot, he sets up the cities of refuge. He works with other new leaders. He, at the beginning of Devarium, he describes how we, there are other people who are going to be in charge in addition to him. At the end of the book, he appoints Joshua. He, he has, he's very careful about appointing the next leader. Devarim is all about giving new laws. The end of Bamidbar also says that he taught a lot of new laws before he died. He told them, he told the leaders of the tribes about the uh, ab- about the laws of vows. In last week's parsha, he told us about the laws of sacrifices. Right? He says, "You're, you're going to die." So then Hashem says, "Oh, and by the way, here are the laws of sacrifices. When you go to Israel, these are the sacrifices for the daily offering." And 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 Moshe taught taught them about uh, about the laws of the cities of refuge. Moshe continues to be the teacher. In the book of Devarim, from Parsha Re'e until Kitavo, there's tons of laws about all kinds of things. About, I don't know, maybe a third of the mitzvot in the Torah are in Devarim. So he's teaching more. And he also rebukes. The beginning of Bamir is all about rebuke, how the Jews did the terrible sin, the sin of the spies and the sin of the golden calf. And they're, they're, he goes into great lengths. Here, in Bamidbar, he doesn't finish the book by rebuking them for these things, but he does review where we've been, some of those places we rebelled. And also, he rebukes the people about what they did in their battle against Midian. He rebukes the tribes of Reuven and God, so he's doing rebuke. And also, Moshe reviews the history. In, in Devarim, in, in Deuteronomy, God, Moshe reviews the history. And in the end of Bamidbar, Moshe also reviews the history with a list. It's not a whole uh, three chapters, but it's, it's a list. And which of those things did he not do in his lifetime? In other words, of all the things that he did when he was about to die, which of them did he not do in his lifetime? Well, clearly he didn't win military victories. He didn't settle the land, right? And we said that he didn't necessarily work with other leaders. He was sick of it. There were no other leaders. They were the leaders who were rebels. The leaders were the spies. The leaders were the Korach. And there's 250 leaders. Uh, he did teach the mitzvot, of course, during his lifetime. Uh, so some of these things he didn't do. As Rashi points out in Devarim, Beginning, he says that um, I'm sorry, this is the wrong. That's not the right Rashi, but Rashi says in Devarim there that um, that Moshe learned from Jacob that before you die, you rebuke the Jews. And that was you can't always rebuke people every day. Uh, you're no good. You're no good. You wait, and then when you're uh, someone realizes you're about to die, you have the luxury of having a deathbed where you don't just die suddenly. You have the luxury of some time, which Moshe had beautiful amount of time to do all these different things. So then during that time, you turn, to, you turn to the people and you rebuke them. So that's the book of Zavarim is a lot of rebuke. And that's what he did in the war of Midian and the people in his interaction with the, with the 
uh, Reuven and God tribes. The, um, the parallel uh, to the idea that Moshe didn't die in Bamidbar, in Devarim, it does say he died, but it says nobody knows where he's buried. So it's interesting, and it doesn't say he didn't die, but like, if you ask, well, okay, if well, he died, then where is he? So, so he said, well, I don't know that. I don't know where he is. So then maybe he's not dead, right? It's like when Elijah went off to the next planet. So everybody said, well, maybe he's over here, over there. And they went looking for him, like for a whole day, they were looking, searching, they put a search committee to find where he was, where's his body. So the fact that Moshe, you don't know where he's buried is sort of like, creates this idea that he didn't really die because he's Moshe Rabbeinu, he's our teacher. We talk about him, we don't say Moshe Rabbeinu of blessed memory. Moshe Rabbeinu, Moshe our teacher. Every Jew, every child, every human being, Moshe our teacher, Moshe Rabbeinu, Moshe our teacher. He doesn't, he didn't die. So in Devarim, that story is told by saying that he, we don't know where he's buried. In Bamidbar, it's told by simply ending the book on Moshe, beautifully adjudicating cases, smoothly, nicely, nobody's fighting, everything's great. So in the book of Bamidbar, it, he never dies. In the book of Devarim, nobody knows where he died. But it's parallel. These two things are similar. So then if you go to our famous chart we've been using throughout this book, and I hope you appreciated these different lessons we've had on Bamidbar. We showed how at the beginning of the book, everything's going great. We're getting ready to conquer Israel. And the people are like, hey, I don't want to be left out. And then the people start to complain. And they have the spies. And then the Korach rebellion. And things are really, really bad. Then in Chukah, things get much better. They kind of have four victories. Everything's good. But then they have the terrible sin of Pinchas, a setback. But then Pinchas takes over. And he's a hero of the book. And everything's improving. And not only that, but at the end of the book, notice that line that goes up. That end of the book, really, Pinchas was just a blip. But everything from, from after Korach, starting Chukah, everything goes up. It, it should say everything goes up through Chukah. Just go down for a moment for Pinchas, and from then everything's up. So it was up in Chukah, it was down for a second in Pinchas, and it was up after that. Moshe, at the end of his life, was extremely successful. He had tremendous success. So what lessons can we learn from the fact that Moshe didn't die in Bamidbar? the fact that he had such a successful end of his life, what lessons can we learn? So one is, of course, you try, you fail, and then you try again, you fail again, eventually you try and you succeed. So in the end of his life, he achieved success. He finally did what he wanted to do to have other helpers and to rebuke and to teach and to have leaders who he could teach and have a student he could teach, a nephew he could teach, he succeeded. I would suggest a few lessons learned. Uh, anybody want to suggest uh, what lessons are learned? What do you think? What lessons are for the fact that Bamidbar is portrayed, number one, that Moshe has great success after he's told that he's going to die. Number two, that he never actually dies in this book. What lessons does that teach us? Well, one thing it says you should never give up. Excellent. Very good. You should never give up. Moshe could have given up a thousand times. He almost did give up. He, he sort of did. But Hashem says, keep, no, no, you're destined for great things. I'm not giving up on you at the burning bush. I'm not giving up on you when you're complaining that every you're whining, you're saying, oh, I give up the Jews. I can't take it anymore. Moshe doesn't give up. Any other lessons? Anyone else? Other suggestions? Very good, Judy. Anyone else? I've got a suggestion, Rabbi. Yes, Malcolm. Uh, I think Moses was creating teachers. The problem is you can't get ahead unless you have good teachers. And by creating good teachers, I think Moses was setting up the rabbis down the road, sitting up people from whom you can learn. The only way you can get ahead is if you've got a good teacher. Good. So, right. As Jews, we, we, you know, I was joking that Moshe is the great con conqueror, but clearly that's not the image we have of him, although he did conquer. Um, but Moshe is like the Mashiach. He's like David, who he could conquer, but mostly he's a scholar. Mostly he's a teacher. And we, as yesh in yeshiva, he's Moshe Rabbeinu. He's Moshe, our teacher. And uh, Rabbi Salvejic, who you know, was supposedly the leader of the modern Orthodox community, he viewed himself as a teacher. Because the most important thing is really to, to, to create leaders after you. And that was, I had described in our discussion about Joshua, that that was a great failure of Joshua. He didn't really have a, a particular follower. He set up like a committee to follow him. Yeah. And it's so important to have followers. And Elazar is really exemplary student. Because the rabbis say that it went like this. Moshe would come from God. He would go and teach it to Aaron 
I forget the exact order, either Aaron or Aaron and his sons, and then repeat it for the Kohanim and then repeat it again for the Jews. So that by the time it was all finished, Elazar had heard it like three, four times. So Elazar was one of the key students. And there was no, no question, there was some nachas that he had that Elazar was teaching these laws. And uh, he appointed uh, the 12 leaders. He appoint, and, and they worked. And, and he, he, he brought them in on the case. He could have said, oh, look, I got this case. If I'm here, what do you need anybody else for? He said, no, we need to have a, a Congress, a representative government, for others, other, uh, and let them see how it works. They adjudicate. If you've got a case, if you've got a case, try to Menashe, for instance, has a case. Take your tribal leader, come to the tri other tribal leaders, work it out, and work it out. Again, this is something that never worked. He did. It, he didn't succeed because Joshua didn't keep it in place. But Moshe was trying to set up something where there was a separation of powers. There was. Uh, I didn't mention, but when we talked about Joshua, Mo Joshua was told to be to be basically tied and tethered to a Lazar. Mm -hmm. He says, "Look." You ask a lot, and you want to do anything, ask a Lazar. He'll tell you where to go. So uh, it never worked out that way. But Moshe's concept was uh, you, have, you have a whole leadership team, and he trained other people. And yes, he was teaching them. As he was dying, he was teaching them laws. He was teaching them how to teach. And he, he allowed other people to begin to teach even as he was still alive. So that's excellent. Any other lessons learned from this, uh, the way the Book of Bamidbar fades out on Moshe's, not death, but his life. Anybody else? Okay, so let's let's take a look at some ideas I put together. But again, if you, just feel free to chime in if you're, you're hesitant or you're, you're thinking about it. Feel free to, 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 to chime in. Hold on a second. There we go. Um, so number one, sort of what Judy said, never give up, right? Don't give up. Uh, it was so frustrating that the, the, no, there was nobody following him. Don't give up. If you're great and you, you, you have a great path, you'll, the goodness will win over time, right? Like they say, and get smart. The good always pervades over evil. Number two, it's not over till it's over. You say, oh, I'm 70, I'm 80, I'm 90. It's all over, right? No. We don't know. We don't know if it's over. It's not over. And you can do great things in a short time. Number number three, make the best of it. Right? You're going to die. All right, but you can appoint the next leader. You can be in charge. You can teach. You can rebuke. You can adjudicate. Right? Number number four, the knowledge of death is freeing and motivating. In other words, once Moshe said, once he once he said, all right, you're finished. So he said, oh, now somehow that gave him like a new breath. And this is kind of a weird point, but. Um, there is something liberating about the idea that, you know, I'm not here forever, um, but um, but now it's time to uh, uh, it's time to get get stuff done because um, it, it, he was he was motivated. It's like I got to get all this stuff done before I die. I, I like to uh, invoke my grandmother sometimes. My grandmother died. At, she she claimed she was seventy eight, but I think she was really eighty, and. Um, <laughs> She, uh, on her deathbed, she say, I have so much to do. How can I die? I have so much to do. So that's Moshe. He had so much to do. He says, wait, before I die, I got some things to take care of. And in the last, I forget the exact number, about a month, about a month before he dies, he gives the whole book of Devarim. In other words, the Jewish memory, the Torah memory of Moshe is that in his last month, he did more teaching than he did in his whole life. Uh, he was he was really the most Moshe after he was told that he was gone. So it's very fascinating. Um, so it's interesting in terms of, let's say someone has, God forbid, a terminal cancer, different different things that, that you know, that kind of spell the writing on the wall that you don't have time left. Uh, there, there can be great, great things that can happen after that. Family reconciliation, um, giving our, our will and testament to our children. There are a lot of good things that can happen. Um, also, what a team can accomplish, right? The idea that Moshe, is one of his main one of his pet peeves was, no, I'm not going to take over the Jews by myself. That's ridiculous. So he said, all right, Aaron will help you. So he said, all right, well, that's, you know, and they got the 70 elders. You know, so, all right, we can talk about it now. And, uh, and then his father-in-law inculcated that in him, right? Your father-in-law is a strong influence sometimes. Um, and he said, look, you got to have helpers. So that was in his mind, like, you got to have helpers. And, uh, and he, he cultivated them. God agreed to this idea 
maybe it was God's idea to begin with, all, everything's God's idea, in the, in the, that there should be other leaders, leaders of each tribe. And God tried to cultivate that. Of course, it was a disaster for, for many years, for many decades. But in the end, the team approach uh, worked and, and teams can accomplish a lot. And, um, and you also sense his drive. Just like my grandmother, um, there's a sense of drive. If you tell someone who's that driven that you have only a short time left, He's got a lot of stuff to do. <laughs> he's, got, he's got a big agenda because he has a lot to do. It's interesting, you know, could Aaron have pulled this trick? Could Aaron say, oh, wait, you want me to go to the mountain? Hold on one second. First, we have to, you know, purify 100 people, and then we'll talk about it. So could anybody else pull this trick? I don't know. There's, it's almost the idea that, you know, some people can have a conversation with the Malach Hamavis. Like, you know, there, there's stories like that where they say, oh, no, Malach Hamavis, look, you must, be, you must have the wrong guy. I'll talk to me later. Go back. I'll come back later. So it's almost like Moshe had this ability to have a conversation with the Malach Hamavis, with his angel of death, with God himself, and say, wait, before I go, I have things to do. He has a tremendous sense of drive. So uh, it should give us, it should be a very encouraging sort of uh, an idea that it's not over, that Moshe is still alive, that our tradition is still alive, that all great people continue with, through us, uh, and that we continue through them. Uh, if if we are even small students of Moshe, so we'll be gone. People will forget about us, but uh, we continue the legacy of Moshe Rabbeinu and of the Jewish people of Abraham, of David, of, of the, the rabbis and the Talmud, and everything else. But just by you know observing the laws of Torah, even to whatever extent we do, and uh, in that sense, we're part of that continuity, and and, and that we really don't die. A, a Jew doesn't die. A Jew is just transformed into another person who continues the same legacy that we had. And, um, and this is a message, well, that's what the rabbis meant when they said Jacob doesn't die, it means the Jews don't die. It means we're, we're forever dying. You know, everyone's always predicting our death is, you know, famous ideas of the ever dying Jew, you know, uh, the Jews are always about to be extinct, right? But, uh, but it never happens and never will happen because we, 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 we have prophecies that tell us that it's not gonna happen. And, um, and even as an ever dying people, you can get a lot done. When you feel that, that oh no, the anti-Semites and the, the, the haters, they're going to kill us, they're going to destroy us, the, the anti-Israel, and it motivates you. And there's never been a stronger country than Israel because they know that they could die. You know, so death is a great motivator. And, um, and uh, as we should bring that attitude not only to the deathbed, but even God willing, we have many years to, we have many years to live. We should, uh, we should bring that sense of drive uh, to every day as well. Uh, so much can be done even in a short time. All right. Any other last uh, thoughts? And I just want to thank you all for coming. Okay. I've just got one. So a few comments, if I may, Rabbi, which you can and I and so on. Okay. Uh, I firstly want to thank you for oh, these sure. classes. It's quite unbelievably valuable. And you know, it's good to learn from you. And uh, I just want to take, I Thank think you. the qualities that Moses had sort of is so all encompassing that it's almost mind boggling when one thinks about it. You know, he, he was creative, he had a lot of perseverance, he was a problem solver, he was always finding a way to solve problems. But I think what he did was he elevated learning above everything else. In other words, if you couldn't learn, if you couldn't find a teacher to teach you, you had to become a good teacher. And he was always looking for somewhere to find more information, whether it was from God or from other people. And what he did was he gave us Jews a great legacy, not only the laws and all this, the, this information, but he enabled us to put education above everything else. In other words, learning. Learning became a very core element. And without that, the Jewish people wouldn't exist. If we weren't the people of the book and of learning, we wouldn't exist today. That's that's my just this my yeah, yeah I, I I would try to bring that out <laughs> this in our, in our final uh, salvo in our final uh, class on Bamidbar which we have oh, really put a lot of effort into I would say that that point is brought out in Bamidbar because um, a lot of my colleagues at the Gush Etzion and the teachers there who were very expert in Tanakh they pointed this out that the relationship Rabbi J J Schechter also pointed out the relationship of narrative and law what is the book of Bamidbar. It's a story of the Jews from the, the second year till the 40th year when Moshe is about to die. But in the middle, they keep, they keep interjecting with various laws. And you say, what are these laws doing here? Uh, 
is it a storybook? Is it a law book? Like, you know, Genesis is a storybook. Leviticus is a law book. What's Bamidbar? So he said, it's an inter- intermingling of the two. And you saw, find it in Exodus to some degree as well. Um, and what does that mean? That what is life? Life is learning. That if, if Moshe is alive for, for another uh, month or something, there's going to be a lot of learning in that month because that's what life is. Life, we say, it is our, the, 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 it is our life. It's the length of our days. In other words, for a Jew, a, a day is a day of learning. Um, my uh, great grandfather of mine used to say to my father, um, his grandson, he would say, "It's the summer. You're on vacation. You, you can't find a few minutes to learn today." Right. So the, uh, the the way the Torah communicates this lesson, the importance of learning, is that as he's about to die, he tells him uh, laws. He say, "I thought he's dying." What, what? The answer is that that every moment of his life was all about the the law, the the Torah, the teachings. And um, the book of Amidbar tells that by saying that, that there's no life without learning. It's lo- story and the learning. The story and the learning. Because wherever they were, they learned something. Even if, if Korah, Korah was the worst rebel in the world, oh, it's a good opportunity to talk about the laws of Kohanim and how you shouldn't rebel against the Kohanim and what the Kohanim in fact do and what the Levites, what their rights and privileges are. Oh, you don't want to go to Israel? Uh, well, this is a great opportunity to talk about when you do go to Israel, you're going to have to take a piece of challah and give it to the Kohen. And you're going to have to have the libations. And, oh, you're going to Israel? You, uh, you, you, I'm going to die now? Oh, we have to have the laws of uh, libations. And when you go to Israel, you have the sacrifices for the for Shabbos and Yontif. And all that. Um, oh, you had a war. Uh, let me tell you the laws of what, how you toivel the dishes when you, when you, uh, when you, get, when you conquer uh, another country. Right? You're going to the land of Israel. People are going to, they're going to be murderers. It's going to be, like Herzl says, It'll be a regular country like every other country. There'll be policemen, there'll be murderers. So you have to have a city of refuge in case somebody kills somebody by mistake. You have to take care of these things, even the worst thing that you can imagine. So uh, I think the way the Torah shows Moses is the great lawgiver, the great exemplar of learning, the way it does it is by, by inter- inter- intertwining life and law uh, in, the, uh, in this book, uh, so much so that, that you don't even know what this book is. It's a strange book. Um, it, it's 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 the, inter, the inter, intermingling of a uh, commingling of of law and life, and the answer is that what, what Malcolm said is that that life life is is learning, um, and uh, I think it, it's a tremendous thing, especially for those who are retired or what you know you're coming to these classes, and um, the, um, the idea that that life does go on when you continue to be learning when you continue to learn. Uh, my mother in law a wonderful example of that. Um, just a lifelong learner. If you're a lifelong learner, there's always something going on. It could be Corona, it could be anything else. You, you're busy. You've got, you've got your Zoom classes, you've got this classes, all these different opportunities on, online these days, more opportunities now than, than ever. You can, you, can, you can attend every university you want to now uh, online. But um, when you, you read the newspaper, you, you, you engage in discussion with your spouse, your friend, um, you're continuing to learn. And, uh, and with that, uh, you, you, you know, you don't just wither away like, like maybe God implied that Moshe was just going to wither away like, like Miriam and Aaron. No, uh, with the learning, you continue to persevere. So thank you for that comment. And, uh, and thank you all. Wow, Rabbi, we have to leave. Thank okay. you so much. Thank you. Sure, sure, sure. Take care, everybody. Okay. Take care.